150 percent back man so what that means to me is that interest is interesting right so <laughs> how true how true interest costs are really calculated is different than what the people see right that's right um interest rate versus effective interest rate right right you talk to us about interest volume that's eye-opening, mind-boggling, mm -hmm. but what's that difference? Like the interest rate we're looking at, right? Like the 6%, or if you go to, you know, any anyone else, like a car loan, they're going to be like 12% or whatever it is. What's the difference between that and the effective interest rate? Well, let's, let's focus on the example we used and we'll expand it a little bit, right? In mortgages is a great example. I've been in and out of that industry 25 years and, and, and probably had 11, 1200 personal clients. So been through that process quite a bit, right? And we always just use focus on the, the till, the truth of lending statement, right? Which people would laugh at because it would show you how much, forget about the APR, that's just a function of cost factored into an interest rate. It would show the actual total amount that was gonna cost you over the long haul. But people would laugh because they'd say, oh, well, I'm never gonna live that way anywhere. I'm like, but you're gonna live somewhere. And now you're gonna repay it over and over and over again. I'll give you an example. And again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, anti-refinancing at all. There's certainly a place for it. I wouldn't say that there isn't, but only if they're capitalizing on using a system like this, a program like this to maximize the benefit they're receiving. Otherwise, let's just say you have a $200,000 mortgage. And here's a crazy statistic. 74% of all clients that have 23 years or more left on their mortgage go back to 30 years. Now, whose advantage is it to, to extend the life of that term four, five, six, eight years. Certainly not yours. It's absolutely to the financial institutions. And now you're going to take that, say, $200,000 balance, and you're going to have expenses to it. Now you might owe two hundred eight or ten or twelve dollars or $15,000, right? Increasing the size of your debt isn't to your advantage. It's ultimately to the banks. Now, again, there are justified reasons to refinance. I'm not going to say that there aren't, especially when people are leveraging the money for some other purpose, or they're doing home improvement, or maybe some debt consolidation. But again, only if we double down on leveraging that additional discretionary income that we've saved and deploy it to accelerate this, set, this system. Because here's what also ends up happening. In these particular cases, even if you went from, let's just say, a six or an 8% interest rate to let's say four, well, you've reduced the note rate, which effectively is what your payments are based on. But if you go back to your new statement, let's say you are four or five, six years into that loan, and now you go back, you reset the clock on that front load interest back to zero, which means you might have lowered your note rate, but you actually increased the amount of interest volume, i.e. the effective interest rate by maybe a couple, maybe 10, 15, 20%. So what people don't realize is it they continue, let me say it this way, why do banks always seem so interested in lowering your interest rate. Now just think about the anomaly there for a second, right? Good question. If you, now grant different banks are holding the loan and then they resell it. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. But theoretically, if you are at six or even 8% alone, why would they have an appetite to have you pay less? Well, it's because you're not actually paying less to them. You're increasing the amount of interest volume when you reset that clock. Now, again, there's a way to mitigate that because I deal with many clients that I want to recommend that they're taking advantage of a lower rate. But again, only if we are going to leverage the additional dollars we've now freed up, discretionarily speaking, and deploy that systematically using a program like this. So it's always not about the amount that you see on the interest rate. That is based. That is your note rate. That is what your payments are based on. But it's the amount of actual interest volume that you're paying. What percentage of each payment, principal interest, is actually going for interest towards the bank? as opposed to principal, which is benefiting you. Now, on a revolving basis, the money is applied first, interest is added second. On a closed end, fully amortized loan, it's the opposite. In fact, no additional monies are applied to that note until the entire minimum monthly payment has been received. So let's take an example of people that do biweekly payments. I'm an advocate for that. I think that's a great way. But it doesn't work the way most people think because they think, well, I'm paying it earlier, it's getting applied earlier too. No, there's 52 weeks in a year. Half that is 26 and half that is 13, which means you're force feeding one additional payment a year. Of course, that's a good thing. But the problem is it's not actually being applied sooner. That's called 14-day amortization. 
There was only a couple of lenders that did that back in the day, and pretty much all of them have done away with that because why would they give up interest they could make, right? So they all kind of got together and decided, let's just do away with that. But if you paid one quarter of your payment every week, no, better yet, let's say you paid one thirtieth of your payment every single day. Well, guess what? It still wouldn't make any difference because the bank is going to hold every single dollar of that until the 30th day, until by agreement in that contract, you've satisfied all the minimum monthly payment due. Then they'll apply it, right? Just like we said, the example of other ways in which we loan out our money. So the question is then, or people pay extra money to principal. Well, that's a great thing too. Here's the problem. How exactly did somebody come up with that number? So let's say, CJ, you're like, yeah, I pay an extra $200 a month of my mortgage. Awesome. At the end of the day, we've got to find a way that we're paying it down faster. Sure. But how did you come up with $200? Was it a catchy number? Was it something you could dance to? And you're like, hey, $200 sounds good. Secondly, do you know exactly the impact, the long-term impact that $200 is going to have? Probably not. Even if you know that it's going to save you X amount of years, do you know how much interest it's going to save you? And here's really the, here's the killer. Is there ever a time where your circumstances change and something affects your budget where you can't send that $200? Sure, probably all the time. It's called life. But do we send $137.12 instead? Or do we tend to send zero? And does that one month sometimes lead to two, three, four months? Right? So are we fully actually algorithmically, mathematically maximizing the leverage of what we can do? And do we understand the impact? See, these become the really, really important parts. CJ, there's a lot of great concepts, a lot of great theories, a lot of great strategies, a lot of great seminars, a lot of great content. That's wonderful. But let me talk straight for a second. Losing weight is easy too. Or let me change that. Losing weight is simple. Eat less, exercise more. There isn't anybody over about the age of 10 or 12 years old that doesn't understand that fundamental concept. But if it was so simple, why do so many people struggle with it so much? We just, we just got past January 1st. In fact, here's a figure that will blow your mind. Today, or as of the time that you actually roll this out tomorrow, we will have been through 10% of this entire year already. Now, statistics tell us that 70 some percent of people had New Year's resolution January 1st have already broken it. And the two top New Year's resolutions every single year, CJ, what are they? Two top New Year's resolutions each and every year. What are they? I'm going to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to get my uh, finances together. That's right. Fitness and finance. It's going to be lose weight, get in shape, get out of debt and save money. Now, here's the important point here. They're the same two fundamentally every single year which tells us two things. One, they're important. They're priorities to people. But secondly, that we continue to fail because I wouldn't have to continue to reset the exact same goal if I was actually achieving it. Now, there could be argues, arguments psychologically about why that is, right? We aren't disciplined. We aren't consistent, et cetera. That would be true, but it's deeper than that. Psychologically, once again, it's that we associate eating with pleasure and dieting with pain, spending with pleasure and saving with pain. Why well, it's called retail therapy. So the problem is, unless we shift that occurring, the way in which we look at those consequences, we're going to continue to do the same things. And by the way, every single time we have a little bit of a tragedy or something goes wrong in life, or we have a little bit of frustration, anxiety, which is only every other Tuesday, we're going to go right back to those things that bring us short-term pleasure, eating and spending. Therefore, why we have the same two every single year. So unless we shift it, Something fundamentally forces us to change the way we look at it. We're not going to. And that is why we've created a system that actually works in a way that shows you the long-term impact of what you did five minutes ago. Now you know what's going to be the impact five, 10, 20 years ago. It's one of the reasons why we use the example of GPS so much. And it was really an analogy that I came up with back in 2006. And it was understanding the basis. Now, back then, let's be honest, this was a while ago for those of you that are younger watching this, okay? Most people did not have one of these, okay? There wasn't even any smartphones then. Nobody had GPS unless you had an expensive car, right? The average person didn't do online banking. We certainly couldn't have done Zoom like this. Everything was manualized, right? Now everybody has a smartphone. Everybody's on social media. Everybody has online banking and everybody's doing Zoom. Even our poor kids had to do it all during COVID and so forth. 
So now we've modernized this. Now, do you think the average person really understands how GPS works? Do you think they understand that's a global network of 23 satellites hovering over the earth at 12,000 feet going 17,400 miles? Nobody knows that. They just know I pump in the address and somehow it tells me where to get there. We've created the same kind of system because we want to help the average person bank like a bank at the push of a button. 